did the whole thing first year at BYU and then I applied to the film program and I got rejected. 10 subscribers, now 200 subscribers and oh, a million subscribers. Like, I had built my whole life to prepare for that moment. Then when the opportunity came, I was ready because I'd done everything to prepare for it. And then they're like, actually the money and everything just fell through. Universal Pictures reached out to me and said, we want to hire you to promote the new Jurassic World. Got millions and millions of views. And then Nintendo reached out to 20, me. 20, 30 people say, Devin, share this video, share this video. And I'm like, I just can't do Trial it. Trials and tribulations are mandatory, um, but misery is an option. I was like, Atlas, that's our, our son. I was like, can you say a prayer that mommy will be okay? And um, this is a three-year-old. And he said like the most perfect prayer. And it just like, it was just like this. And then my wife was like, Atlas, that was like the most perfect prayer. And then my wife went to sleep for like the last three hours and she like woke up perfect. <laughs> So, Devin, thank you for coming today. Absolutely. Um, how long have you lived in Utah? I came here in 2007. Yes, but you haven't been here recently. Uh, yes, I have been. Actually. Oh, you have been. Okay, well, Mind blown. I, I'm putting I'm putting words into your mouth. I just haven't seen you around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're good. Okay, so tell me, 2007, you're here. Yeah, because I'm from Oregon, for okay. Portland, Oregon. Okay. Um, and then I came here to go to BYU. Okay. So 2007, my whole thing was I want to go to the film program and I'm gonna be a filmmaker. Like that was like a kind of a mindset from since I can remember. And I did the whole thing first year at BYU and then I applied to the film program and I got rejected. So it was like the most heartbreaking thing because you can only apply twice to the film program. After two times, you can't apply again. Is that is there still a cap? It's still a cap. They, they just want Because so many people are wanting yeah. to apply and they only want the best of the best. So I was like volunteering on everyone's shoot. So I was like, and the only reason I'm here at BYU right now is to do the film program. Like I am going to be a filmmaker. There's nothing in between for me. Yeah. And I got rejected. So I cried, I called my parents, was bawling, did that whole thing. And then I was like, hey, I'm going to do it again. And I just volunteered times a thousand on everyone's shoot again. And then I applied and then I got in. So then it was like, okay, I, I got this. Um, but for me, it was like always I wanted to go to BYU and I wanted to be in the film program. Like that was like a big deal for me. The film pro program, is it? Is it? I, one of my one of my best friends is a professor now. He wasn't there in 2007. Uh -huh. He's a professor now. And I knew um, the head Leffler. Yes, he's my Tom Leffler. He's my best friend's wife's father. Okay. So... Um, I know him pretty well. Yeah. Is I love he... Tom Leffler. He, he was one of the people that's very um, intimidating because he's so good at what he does. And yes. he's the one that kind of determines if you get accepted. One of the people. Yes. He's the gatekeeper. And he's so he was always terrifying me, but I like learned to love him and understand him. And it was like, I honestly feel like um, the reason I have success is because of all the rejection I've gotten throughout my whole life. Mm -hmm. But like even in my senior year at BYU in the film program, I um, applied for my capstone. All my friends got their like senior project approved. And mine was like one of the only ones that got rejected um, for my senior project. Why? Why, why are they doing it? It was too ambitious was one of the reasons. One of the which, other reasons, though, which is not surprising knowing your career now. <laughs> yeah, something like that. But yeah. the other reason was because I'm naturally like really shy. I'm like an extreme introvert. And I was relying on everyone else around me to kind of lead the conversation and lead the discussion. So I had like my whole team of like the producers, the writers, and I was kind of like looking at them to answer the questions for me. And they're like, if you're going to direct this and you're going to lead this team, mm -hmm. you have to be the one fully in charge. And so for me, I got rejected from my senior project. I was like totally heartbroken and like, what, where do I fit in this world of filmmakers? Because I am a shy introvert. And then I had opportunity to go to Hawaii to do a documentary. Um, and then I was like, okay, I'm just going to drop out for now and hopefully come back. And then I ended up going to Hawaii. Um, so it kind of all happened that way. And, but through going to Hawaii, that's when I discovered my own voice and gained my own confidence through that. Okay. So, I want to talk about that. So you, did you ever finish? I haven't finished. I never did either. I went, to, um, I went to the commercial music program okay. and I started, they were having me do assignments that I was getting paid by clients to yeah, do yeah, yeah. professional. Uh -huh. And I'm like, I think I've capped out. You know, I don't know. It's the same thing. It's like, no, it's very similar. Like I have a year left, but it's just a couple classes. And I actually taught at BYU for a year, like as an adjunct professor on oh, social media. Oh, cool. Um, and then I like last um, couple of months ago, I spoke at this huge presentation thing for BYU for the whole like theater media arts, like major. So for me, I've had so many opportunities and then they like sent me down like Devin, you're so close to graduating. We, we just got to figure this out so we can get you out of here. Yeah. Um, so I'm like, I want my kids to know that their dad graduated, <laughs> but at the same time, like to stop everything we're doing for the next year is mm -hmm. like, that's also kind of a scary thing to do. Are they making it really easy for you or are they going to still make you do the requirements? We haven't dived into it. I, I do think, I think it'd be kind of a medium ground. Cause I, I know they want me to still do something yeah. for it. Not just like get the diploma kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but it's like, I have. I feel like proven myself and done my time within the system and everything. But I know there's still a couple of core things I'd have to get done. So. Yeah. Okay. So 
present day, you uh, when when I hear Devin Supertramp, I think of just epic, um, ambitious YouTube videos. Yeah. Okay. Um, tell me about your first one and like your your thoughts. Like, how did you get into? Because also, I, I read on Wikipedia that you wanted to be a filmmaker, like do features. Yeah. Is this true? This is true. This is true. And you, have you made a feature yet? I haven't. No. This is this, this is so fascinating. So why haven't you? And then what what did you do instead? Yeah. So the goal is to do Hollywood films. Like I, I just say Jurassic Park is like the most iconic film in my life. Of like I want to make Jurassic Park. I want to make Star Wars, Indiana Jones, like those type of films. Like that was the mm-hmm. goal. That was a dream while I was going to film school. And then um, 2009, 2010, my roommate at the time, his name is Jeff Harmon. He started a company called Vid Angel and the Harmon oh, Brothers and stuff like so that. That's so crazy. Yeah. So him and another guy named Austin Craig, who's in like the marketing at BYU and like a lot of that type of stuff, they were like, Devin, you need to start doing YouTube videos. Like that's going to be like the future of filmmaking. And I was like, ah, I don't want to do a little teeny video and put it on YouTube. And he was like, Devin, you got to jump on YouTube. And then my friend Dave Peterson, kind of, we all kind of at the same time crossed paths. And Dave Peterson's like, we should do a song featuring one of our songs and go up to Alpine and do a bike jump. And um, they showed us a clip, um, Jeff Harmon, my roommate at the time, and it was a guy or a girl hitting the bike jump there and it had like 2 million views. So like if you did it with Dave's song and your style of cinematography, like I think that'll be huge on YouTube. And I was like, uh, okay, I'll, I'll give it a shot. I did that video and then put it on YouTube and then all of a sudden, like the first day got a thousand views. And then a couple of days later, it was like 400,000 views. And then all of a sudden, different companies from all around the world started reaching out to me. Bro. And I was just like, it was kind of like instant um, success, which I know is normally not the case. Yeah. Um, but it was like the first one we really did kind of blew up. Um, with that said, though, is I had a couple other YouTube channels throughout like three, four years before that. Nothing ever happened with that. But it was like, Start my own YouTube channel again, third time, third channel, and then that's when it blew up from doing that video. What, what do you call the channel, or what was it originally called? Um, they're like I started my mission in Jamaica, uh-huh. so, and I love snowboarding, so my first channel was called Snow Jamaica, um, <laughs> and then the second one I started my own little production company is called Greenlight Films, so the channel was called that, um, and then the third one was called Devin Super Tramp. And the whole idea for that was I had just finished reading a book called Into the Wild. Yep, I know it's, it well. Yeah, it's about a guy named Alexander Su- or uh, Chris McCandles. And his whole thing was, I want to go to Alaska to live my dreams. And Alone. Uh, alone, yes. Yeah, like explore alone. Exactly yeah. that. And then he ends up dying. So it's kind of like a tragedy story. But the whole the whole thing that was like going for your dreams and fighting for it, my whole thing was like, I want to live my dreams um, of making films so when he went for his dreams he called himself alexander super tramp so I'm like okay i'm gonna do this i'm just gonna create a youtube channel it was like two o'clock in the morning kind of thing like i need a channel because we're gonna have it go live tomorrow and i was like devin super tramp so we did that and then i mean the whole debate was like do we put this on the music channel like can't stop won't chat stop who was like the youtube channel or do we put it in ours and we're like well i'm gonna keep on doing videos and they might yeah. do a couple so we ended up putting it on my channel which kind of like changed the game for me um, but yeah, put that up, not really expecting a whole lot coming from it. And it was just really like, I didn't own a camera. Dude, it was a pretty, but it was a pretty high production. I mean, in my opinion, when I saw it for the first yeah, time, yeah. because I grew up in Alpine and I was telling you before we started recording, my childhood, childhood bike is in the bottom of that pond. Uh-huh. Yeah. But, um, it, it seemed like it was done really, really well by a pro. I mean, that was my perception when I first saw it. How do you feel now looking back? No, I'm still like super proud of it. Like yeah. we filmed it on a DSLR camera, um, yeah. a Canon 5D Mark II. And at the time, Jeff Harmon, uh, my roommate, he they had just started a company called Aura Brush. It was like a tongue cleaner. And we were already doing all these YouTube videos for that channel. They were already blowing up. So I was already kind of in the ecosystem of YouTube and understanding that power. Mm-hmm. And I just borrowed their camera for that shoot. So it was like everything was done on a $0 budget. We posted on Facebook just to get random people there that showed up. Hey, yeah. bring your own bikes, bring some buoys so they don't sink. Um, and we ended up making the video. And But it was literally just me and a couple friends making a video for fun, putting it on YouTube, and then it ended up blowing up. Um, so we were kind of – it was a calculated thing as far as like we'd seen someone else do it and be mm-hmm. successful. Yeah. But the quality wasn't very good. So it's was like what can we do to kind of – spice it up and take it to the next level. When do you think, I mean, do you think YouTube's peaked as far as usage and, and like the appeal of YouTube? Do you think it's peaked or is I, it still going to peak? I feel it's the gold rush when I got in, yeah. like the California gold rush where yes. you get to California first. Yes. So I got the gold or whatever it is. And then some people came and still find gold, but it's a lot harder. There's a yes. lot more noise. Um, before there's very few videos that were high quality. It was yes. just vlogging and people talking to the camera and ours was like full scale productions on yeah. a $0 budget. 
Um, so it definitely made us like stand out drastically more. Like people reached out to me and said, hey, like from that video, a big cam camera company at the time, Flip Cameras, they're like, Devin, we want to hire you to shoot a nationwide TV commercial. So they're like, okay. And this is like me as like a BYU student. I uploaded that video and then um, I, I moved to Hawaii. So it all happened really fast. Were you able to move to Hawaii because of the money you made from the video or was No, because this... I wasn't monetizing that channel at that time. Like it took a, a lot to like have be able to actually monetize something. Uh -huh. um, and, and now it's a different story. But like I like I hadn't set that up and I didn't have enough subscribers at the time. But I remember getting one subscriber and then like, oh, 10 subscribers, now 200 subscribers and oh, a million subscribers. Like it, it all happened fairly How fast. How many subscribers do you have right now? Uh, 6.2 million ish that's, on YouTube. It's ridiculous. So that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> slowly building it up. Okay. So you had success, like really your first thing that you tried. Yeah. And, and with that said is like on that channel, I had uploaded two other videos. Um, mm -hmm. one of them was like a family vacation with my parents and my brothers and mm -hmm. sister in Canada. And I, I did that video and it, it like, the comments were really nice, but it, it didn't like blow up. And I had other little teeny video of a, um, a little boy running through a field and kind of looked like Africa. So I call it like fields of Africa. And, but that was like technically like my third, fourth video that I'd uploaded. Mm -hmm. And then that's the one that blew up. Okay. But so do you, do you feel like it's a blessing or a curse that you had success that early or is what, it a little of both? Like what, how did you re, how do you react to such, like, cause it's such an unknown, right? It was the gold rush of YouTube. Yeah. I, when I look at it now and, um, I, I mean, I don't think I looked at it at the time this way, but it's like, I don't feel like I, I got lucky and had success. Like I look at my entire life of filming on every shoot I had volunteered on. Like my whole life had built up for that where it wasn't like I just got lucky and won the lottery. It was like, I was filming every day before that for free. Like I wasn't getting paid. I was volunteering on every student film at BYU. Oh, they don't have a job for me. Hey, can I cook the food for everybody? Like I was doing whatever I could. So it wasn't like I had built my whole life to prepare for that moment. Then when the opportunity came, I was ready because I'd done everything to prepare for it. Dude, that is so rad. Okay. So you moved to Hawaii um, and you're single, right? I'm how, single. how old are you at this time? Um, 26. Seven. Okay, so you're having fun. You're single. You moved to Hawaii, and what do you do there? So I got offered to do a documentary in Hawaii on a surf photographer named John Mozo. Okay. And um, a, a year, six months before that, we had shot a video for BYU Independent Study there, and I was like, I'd love to come to Hawaii and film more stuff here, but I, I have to like have a reason. I can't just go to hang out because mm -hmm. that's not my personality. Yeah. And um, then like during that time, I got a call, and they're like, Hey, Devin, there's this really cool documentary that they think you'd be awesome for. Um, someone I had like connected past with um, through talking and there's like, they have a budget, they'll have cameras, all the equipment you'll need. And I'm like, Oh, amazing. This is perfect timing. I just got rejected from my senior project at BYU. Mm -hmm. um, so they got me a flight out there and I got there and then they're like, actually the money and everything just fell through. Um, so we don't have a budget for anything. So I was like, shoot, what are we going to do? And I was living at their house for free and it was like a college house. There was seven other BYU Hawaii students. Mm -hmm. And, um, so then I was there, no money and they didn't have any funding and I just uploaded that video and it started getting views. And then I was able to monetize and start making some money from it. But my, my roommate, he had a camera, Canon 7D. So it wasn't like this big expensive yeah. camera. And, um, I would just, while I was like kind of on standby, figuring things out, I would just start filming the BYU Hawaii students because they do all these crazy, like fun, exciting things. So I just started shooting them. Um, and uploading onto my YouTube channel. And then those videos started getting millions and millions of views as well. So did you just took the initiative and you said, I'm sitting here, there's no budget for this project. I'm just going to go out and start filming yeah. students having fun. Oh my gosh. Okay. So like none of this would have happened because it was like, I wasn't waiting for someone to call and reach out to me to create opportunity. I was like, I just, I love filming. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not filming, I'm going to be filming something else, even if there's no purpose to it, just Dude. to like learn and grow from it. What a freaking lesson to people who have a passion for something instead of waiting for the budget for the client. I mean, that's, that's all the coolest projects projects that I've ever done and the most success I've had. And the future jobs that I get is from the ones that I do on my own, my passion. Oh projects. yeah. hundred percent. 100%. Like, like no doubt that is what got me the, the big jobs that I have. You know what I'm saying? Like that, it's so true. So it's cool to see the pattern yeah, in your life that, as well. Yeah. The biggest opportunities I've got in my career have been from like doing things for free. Mm -hmm. um, like example that I was talking about earlier, um, I don't know how we're going to get here, but yeah. like for me, I wanted to make a Jurassic Park film. 
So I was living in Hawaii, and this was six years ago now, because I, I moved back to Utah after yeah. that, and then I moved back to Hawaii again for a year once I got married. But I was like, I'm just going to make a Jurassic Park fan film, and I don't have a budget, so I'm going to use like a big inflatable like dinosaur costume. Mm -hmm. I use my wife and just a couple local friends in Hawaii. I did that video. I put it on YouTube, and then like a month later, Universal Pictures reached out to me and said, Devin, we saw this video. Bro. We want to <laughs> hire you to promote the new... Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom film. Yeah. And um, we just want to give you the budget you need, the resources you need. So I was like, this is like a dream come true. So I did that video and ended up getting like 40 million views for them. And then it got over 100 million views on Facebook for them. Why so many more on there? Just the, there the two different platforms, yeah, two okay. different algorithms. And the algorithms always change. Like I never know anymore. I just like create what I'm passionate about and hopefully something happens. What, but a, good, what, a, good, what a good lesson instead um, of worrying about al algorithms. Yeah, I yeah. just, I've decided to not chase it anymore because I'm not excited about it anymore. I just feel depressed about it, I think. You mean like numbers? Y yeah, like I just, it's because the numbers aren't there like they used to be. So I was like, I could try and chase the numbers and not create something I'm passionate about, not proud of. Um, and if nothing happens with it, I'm still kind of sad about it. But if I create something I'm passionate about it, at least I'm still happy and proud of something, even if it doesn't take off. Amen. Um, so I was lucky in this case, though, with that video. And then they hired me to do one for Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. Then they hired me to do one for Jurassic World Dominion. And then I got to work with, like, the main actors and cast. Did you meet Chris Pratt? I didn't meet Chris Pratt. Oh. We saw Chris Pratt. But, like, Sam Neill, who was, like, in the original Jurassic Park. Like, yeah. Huge fan. The, the like, we got to meet him. Dude, Doctor. What's his doctor? Um, Ian Malcolm. No, Ian Malcolm's the other guy who we He's met as Jeff well. Goldblum. You met Jeff, Jeff Goldblum. Goldblum? Yeah, we met him. We met the whole cast. Oh, my god. And then gosh. we got a film with Bryce Dallas Howard. She's And then awesome. one of the main girls in it, the new one in the new movie, Dewanda. Um, we also got to film her. And so it was, like, we had this amazing opportunity on this back lot at Universal Studios um, and then after that, then they hired us to do one for Fast and the Furious 9. Um, so I got to work with Tyrese, um, Jordana Brewster, who's like the main girl from Fast and the Furious. Yeah. And then um, Sung, um, he's like the Asian guy that's always eating chips. Like, Yan. Yan. No, Han. Han. Han, Han. Yeah, yeah, that's his name. Um, I just saw Fast 10. Okay, yeah. I haven't seen Fast 10 yet. Um, Sung's his, act, his real name, though. So yeah. I got to have them in my video as well. And we got to do like this really cool street race scene with RC car. And we actually melt, like, a, made like a jet engine car. Um, we filmed that with those actors for our like promo video. And then we got to do one for uh, first man. These are all like universal picture movies. Yeah. So then I got to train to be an astronaut. I got to work with Ryan Gosling, Damon Chazelle, like the, the director for that film who also did La La Land. Um, oh so gosh. from doing like a fan film, they saw universal pictures and then I just did put my whole heart into it. And then they kind of keep on hiring me for all their different franchises that they think will be a good fit. Dude, this is unreal. I mean, do you, could you, do you, do you want more? Like, are you like, I need it. I'm like the next tier is this. Like, how do you feel about your career? Like the trajectory at this point? No, that I mean, you asked earlier about like the goal was Hollywood feature films, but it's shifted because I get to work with these Hollywood films, Yeah. but I'm in control of the film and the story I'm making. So instead of like directing a Hollywood film, which would be amazing. But at the same time, that also means I'm gone from my family for five or six months. Yeah. So now that I have a family, I look at that different. Cause I, when I leave for two weeks now and I come back, it's like, we have a three-year-old and like, he's drastically a different person. I know, man. Um, so, and it was different for different people, but I, I feel for me right now with what I'm seeing with my own family, um, is like, I don't want to miss those opportunities because it's already hard being gone for two weeks for me. Mm -hmm. Um, so for me, it's like, I still get to work with brands that I love and do things I love and be in control of the things I love. Um, but across like the board, uh, I found out is like, I, Nintendo for me was like the ultimate brand to work with because I grew up with the Nintendo and mm -hmm. Zelda and Mario. And I did a big Mario Kart video that I funded, put it on YouTube and it got millions and millions of views. And then Nintendo reached out to me to do two commercials for them and do like a full sponsored video for Smash Brothers, which was like my favorite video game. Um, so it's just like I do films on things I'm passionate about, and a lot of the times those companies see it, and then they hire me to do more things. How um, how do you day to day not let things get to your head, stay grounded? Do, do, how do you do that? Because we see when people get success, there's there's usually there's two paths. I mean, you can go yeah the one way or the other. You've obviously stayed pretty grounded. You got married. You're having a child. You have you have a kid. You're another on the way. Yeah, in two weeks. Yeah, so congrats. It's amazing. You have this beautiful family. How do how do you stay grounded? I, I don't know if you consider yourself grounded. I would say you are, but like I want to know. I want to know how you do I'm, this. I'm, I still look at myself. I mean, I hate to say this, like almost a, that sounds too negative, but almost like a failure because I feel like every week 
I'm having to reinvent myself and constantly fail and constantly get rejected Mm -hmm. because I'm constantly putting myself out there and anything I release, I'm putting my heart into it. Sure. But like I was picked on so hardcore growing up from like kids at school and stuff like that. So I feel like going into it, I was like so already like downtrodden and like I'm not I'm not capable of this and constantly getting rejected. So I think all those things have made it so I can do what I do now. Um, because I've, I've faced all that rejection and I have a harder shell because of it. Um, but it's like, I released a video this week and it bombs. So now I'm like, I'm on an all time low <laughs> yeah. and then I release another video and it does okay. And, but I put my heart into it and I put like everything I have into it. So I'm feeling down and then I do one video and it pops, but then the next week, the next video drops, you know? So I feel every week I'm just getting hammered. So there's no way I, I don't think I could just be like, I'm on top of the world because, and what I found too, when I have these goals and these dreams is like, you hit that dream, you hit that goal, but then you have higher dreams and higher goals. So you never really get to where you want to get because your horizon just expands and gets bigger and bigger. Do you know Jeremy Warner? Yes. Okay. He's a good buddy. Yeah. He's college awesome. roommates. Like we live in the same house. He acted and, in our smash brothers video actually. Oh yeah. He was one of the people playing it. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Okay. So he was on a couple of weeks ago, okay. or like a month ago. And he was saying that he was like, I don't know how old he was, 28 or something. He found his old journal and he had like accomplished every goal that he set. And he's like, well, <laughs> he's like, well, and then he, then he had the realization of it's not about the goals. It's about how you do everyday life. Yep. It's how you, and do you want to speak on that instead of like, because it sounds like you're very affected by um, the wins and losses uh-huh. as, as we all are. Yeah. But you obviously are a stable human being because you're getting back up. You're not stopping. So congrats on that. How, how are you, how do you, um, once again, how do you do that? How are you able to like overcome the, the bummer of a, of a video bombing and the, it's actually the same. It's actually kind of the same emotion that the, the spectrum of like being bummed out and then being excited. You know what I'm saying? It's like, we, yeah, yeah. How, how do you, how do you want to keep going? Are you, are you inspired by ideas? Do you, is it because you have a family now? Like what's, what's driving you now? Yeah. So, um, after my mission, I got home, I was like, I'm gonna make movies. And I made a movie with a lot of the people from my singles ward. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'm so proud of it. This is amazing. And I premiered it at the church. I got like 200 people there Mm -hmm. and I had like DVDs to sell to everybody. And I made a ton of them, like 40 or 50 of them. And after that premiere, it was like silent and no one liked the movie. (laughs) And it was very clear no one liked the movie and no one even bought a DVD. And I remember leaving that day and thinking, I, I'm not made to make movies. And I just remember feeling so discouraged. And like I went home crying. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was like, I'm, I was ashamed because I had like all my friends and people from the singles ward in it. And I was like, they all think this is awful. Like, I, I, I don't even remember if anyone even like patted me on the back and said, well, that was good. Like, it just wasn't there. I think it was just everyone left like, this wasn't good. Like, I don't know. But, um, I remember like a week later, like after I'd gone through like the grief or whatever you want to call it, um, I was like, Oh, but I love it. And I'm going to create and I'm going to figure it out. And then I ended up spending another year creating, it was a dance mockumentary about dancing, becoming illegal. It's kind of like footloose vibes, but mockumentary documentary mm-hmm. style. And then like a year later, I premiered it. But this time I premiered it in a, in a movie theater. Like I rented out an old fashioned movie theater mm-hmm. and I got like 400 people there. And then I made a bunch of money where I, I used that money to fund me going to BYU like a month later. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, like I had this awful experience and then I was like, hey, well, I'm going to figure it out because I love it. Like regardless of if I have the views or not, I'm still going to be creating. And I even see that now, whereas like, hey, the views aren't there like they used to be. But I'm still going to create what I love to do because it's, it's instilled in me. And it's like, I'm always going to be like, I'm not, I'm not the one to retire. Like to me, retiring is not like a real thing. It's just mm-hmm. like, I'm just going to create as long as I can. Anything I make goes right back into production. So I don't know if that fully answers the question, but for me, it's just like. It does. I'm going to make an observation. You can tell me if I'm wrong. I think one of your strengths is that you feel your feelings and you let the feelings go. It sounds like you've cried a bunch in your life. I think that's actually a real big strength because you're not saying, oh, that's okay. And you're bottling it up and then letting that like wound fester. Yeah. You know, people, men tend to let that fester and they have a bad experience. And then that's like this pain point in their life that they're not going to revisit again because it was so painful. And I think one of your strengths is you let that go. You felt it and you cried it out and you moved on because your core value was you love making art. 
instead of you instead of trying to avoid pain and humiliation you you love that more right. what would you say to someone who's uh not necessarily just like doing youtube but like someone who's doing something in the creative industry and they're not having a ton of success yet but that you but they know they have that deep rooted knowing that they have a gift like and and there's ups and downs and they're trying to figure it out like what if you were to or maybe this how about if you were to put your arm around yourself before when you were having a hard time in college what would you tell yourself trying to think of something profound to say no no no. i don't want profound i'm just like what would you no i mean i think for me it's been like being surrounded by good people okay. has been a huge part. Like I was lucky because I had incredible parents. Yeah. Like my mom and dad, like they never questioned, can you make a living off of that? They're like, do what you love to do. And they always knew I love making movies. So they've never questioned it. And even like, okay, I just remember like we didn't have a ton of money, but my dad like took what we had and he bought me like a Mac computer so I could be editing our videos while going at film school because everyone else had Mac computers, mm-hmm. you know? And it was like, that was a big deal for me. But like for me, it's just been like, every amount of success I've seen in my life is because I surround myself with other people that believe in me, even if they don't like see the things I'm doing, they're like, Hey, he's really passionate about it. I still want to help this kid out. Um, and even to this day, it's like people believe in me and I believe in other people, but the more I can help build other people, like the first video that we did is with, um, can't stop, won't stop. They're Mm -hmm. like the music people. Yeah. Dave's on the podcast. Okay. Those listening, you know, David, he was on like a month ago. Uh huh. But like him, like he ended up doing, 30, 40 songs for me, maybe not 40, but a, a lot of songs for our YouTube videos. We were both benefiting from it. Like he was able to make a living through iTunes sales at the time and everything like that. Mm-hmm. And I was able to get cool videos with awesome songs. So it's like, as we both build up each other, both put in our talents. So for me, I, I think like I, what I say is like, don't be afraid of other people. Um, don't look at anyone as competition. It's like, how can I help build them? That's really hard to do though. It is hard to it's do. It's really hard. Can you tell me, tell someone how to not, look at people as competition when you're in the same field. Yeah. I, I, mean, I can talk to that, but I want to hear what you say. It's, it's easier said than done. It but is. I think a big part of it is having a conversation with them. Cause then you start realizing, Oh, they're not as evil and bad as I thought they were. <laughs> cause when, cause like, for me, it was like, I was doing a lot of extreme sport videos and they started getting millions of views. So some of my other BYU pairs started doing it as well. And I'm like, that's Did they really, my, they, my were, they were taking your model kind of, they're taking similar model. Yeah. It's still putting their own flair on it. Yeah. Um, like one of them was, um, um, Scott Wynn. He was another filmmaker. Oh, yeah. I, I love yeah. Scott Wynn. Yeah, totally. But we went to film school and his thing was his own thing still. And I was like, he was doing music for our videos. Yeah. But I still felt like, oh, that's in my ground. And there's another guy and another like. Wait, did you get a little jealous? You like kind of like. It was like, this is my territory. Yeah. Um, and another guy, Jameson, I say their names, Jameson Dayton, because like I love these people. Mm-hmm. But I also like when he started doing something very similar to what we were doing, they only did like a few videos in this style. But I was like, this is my territory. And, and then like, um, They'd reach out to me, Devin, can you promote it? Because you have this awesome audience. And I'm like, uh, I don't want to promote it. And then it created hard feelings. And so it's like people don't realize when you have success, like everyone jumps to you. Mm. And then all of a sudden you start making everyone mad. And all you're trying to do is do the best you can do. Because I'm having 20, 30 people say, Devin, share this video, share this video. And I'm like, I just can't do it. Mm-hmm. But those two people I mentioned, Scott and Jameson, was like, it created weird feelings. But then once we actually like sat down and, and like had a real conversation, I was like, okay, we're on the same team. And then those feelings just went away. But it's hard to have those face-to-face conversations because I'm not a, like a conf- confrontational confrontational person. Mm-hmm. Um, but once I, I had those conversations and I'm like, okay, these are people that I love. And like I talked to Scott Wynn a couple of weeks ago and it's like I was helping him out with this or he'll help me out with this. You know, it's like I, I've learned that 99.9% of anyone that you deal with in the creative space, they're not there to try and destroy you or, or and it doesn't matter at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. Um, when they have success, I have success as well. So. Um, it's been really cool, but it hasn't been like an overnight thing that I've learned that or realized that. But mm-hmm. having a face to face conversation has definitely like changed the game as far as like, oh, they're just people too trying to figure it out. Okay. Awesome lesson. Anything else you would say to your younger self? Which is which is essentially you're just teaching us on the podcast. You're just telling us and it doesn't even have to relate to creative things. Just just what what has Devin Supertramp learned in his life about a career with high highs and low lows? Yeah, I, I a big part of I feel the success I have seen is because I've stayed true to the standards Mm -hmm. of the gospel. And it was like everything that we create still has that taste of the standards, even if it's not in your face. Mm -hmm. But I feel I've had so many like amazing opportunities because of that. Like earlier on in our 
career and my career, like Budweiser reached out to me and said, hey, Devin, we have this huge budget. It was the biggest budget I've ever seen. And like, we want to hire you to do a full like Budweiser thing. But it's like, that's not who I am. Mm-hmm. And I was like, that's how, a did, lot of how money. did you feel turning that down? It, it was actually not as hard as you would think. Maybe you think it'd be easy. Mm. I don't know. But yeah. um, but for me, it was like, um, like we were doing pretty okay at that time anyway. So mm-hmm. it wasn't like a dire do or die kind of thing. Um, but it was like, it felt good because I was like, I, I kind of chose what my standards were. Like I already committed to my standards before I even was on YouTube. So it was like, oh, because I've seen so many people change that. Mm-hmm. But I already said in stone, like, this is my rule book. This is the way I'm going to play it. And so when I've had those opportunities, like I've already chosen it. So it's, it's fairly easy to say no. Mm -hmm. And then like a couple like years later, Disney came to us and it was for Peach Dragon and and on the rule book, on their rule book on Disney, one of the rules to work with Disney for this project was I couldn't have worked with an alcohol beverage. So now I have this really awesome opportunity for Disney. Yeah. Um, So it's just been really cool like that. Um, Like I had a gnarly one. Um, We were filming a video with the NFL and this is in Florida with the NFL. Like I'm in the middle of the NFL stadium. And which stadium? um, The Miami Dolphins. Buccaneers? No, Miami Dolphins. Yeah. There's two of them. Tampa Bay Buccaneers. (sighs) Jacksonville Jaguars. Maybe it was, it was Jaguars. I yeah. think it was Jaguars. Okay. Yeah. So in the middle of the stadium, and we ha- we're filming with all the cheerleaders there. And this is for like Panasonic um, project, but it was mm-hmm. also for our YouTube channel. And they all come out. And for me, too, it's been like keeping things like family friendly and modest. And the outfits that all the girls came out with was like... <laughs> um, so I walked up to the coach and I was like, I can't feature this on my channel. Like this isn't who I am. Yeah. And she's like, well, sex sells. And this is what sells for us. Did she literally say she sex said, sells? See, it was sex. It was something to yeah. that effect. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm not like saying a direct Which quote. Which is so cliche. But, but just funny if she did But something like that. And this is me talking like the woman head cheerleader yeah. or, or the captain or whatever it is and organizing all the women. And she's like, well, you're out here and we're all out here. So this is what we're capturing. And um, I like went to a couple of people on my team. Like, I'm not sure what we're going to do about this. So I go back out there and this is like me and, and like, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 women all there dressed. Not very like for, for my audience. Dude, did that feel so awkward? Cause it was just you and all these women or did you have a team? Of- I, I had a team there. So it okay. wasn't, but, but it was still like, still it's like- me like in picture, like an empty stadium and me with all these women <laughs> in a big line. <laughs> and I'm like, everyone here is very beautiful. And I did this in like, I feel like the most now, like I literally, I said a prayer beforehand, like in my head and I kind of thought I need help. Like, I don't know what I'm going to do about this. Um, this isn't going to work for my, ch- I'm not gonna feel comfortable doing this. Um, I said, so women, you're all very beautiful, but the goal for this video is we want everyone across the world to see it mm. despite their beliefs, despite it being Christian or Muslim. And, and part of that will be to make it, um, family friendly. Um, and it was a done in like, a, I think like the most tasteful way it could have been done. Um, and I said like, in order for that to do it, we'll just need to cover up some. And, and um, I really believe that this is going to make a huge difference. And all the women started like nodding and they're then all they cool all, with it. They're all cool with it. They yeah. all went in, they came out and then they had like so their jackets cool. on. And so that's cool. what we ended up shooting. And the video has, I don't know, 14, 15 million views. Um, and it just blew up across the world. But it was like it was done in a way where it wasn't like because of my standards of what I believe in. It, it didn't nothing felt weird about it. It just felt like a naturally organic way. Um, and but it was just like this weird thought of this like shy introvert talking to and like tell, demanding kind of, essentially like this is the way it's going to be. But in a way that was like respectful to them as well. Did you feel like you had the words given to you, or did you know what to say? Like how did how I, I never know the words to say? Um, so I 100 percent like it, it was help um, yeah. from a higher power. And I just feel I've seen it so many times, though. but it's like I established that. Mm-hmm. And when I've had like we did a huge ad campaign for Aruba Tourism, it was the same type of thing. Mm-hmm. So I, I've learned actually I have a rule book now where I, anytime I think their brand might be a little bit questionable of what they want to do. Uh-huh. I say these are the rules that we follow um, and, and this is how it's going to be if you want to work with us. And they've never said no because of it. Um, and then it just makes it easier and there's avoids any awkward conversation, but I've established, okay, this is why I'm going to do this. And I think one of the big things I've, I've had that mindset is like, 
on my mission, we're trying to help the guy live a word of wisdom. Um, what is the word? Not everyone who listens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What so is the word, of word of wisdom in our church is like a fr- um, abstaining from like alcohol, marijuana, like harmful substances. Okay. And one of the guys was, I can't remember. I think it was, he was smoking like a, a pack of cigarettes a day. Mm-hmm. And I was, um, we're like, how do we help this guy? And my mission president, he's like, well, why don't you smoke? And I was like, well, because I know it's not healthy. And he's like, that's not why you don't smoke. And what he pointed out to me is like, there's a time in my life where I was like, this is how I'm going to live my life. And by like making that decision, and then you decide every day to keep on living that. Mm -hmm. So I feel like with what I've done with with YouTube on social media is by having success, I've also determined that I'm going to live this standard. And this standard is important to me. Like the conversation I have with my mission president about like, I made that decision that this is how I'm going to be. And this is the way I'm going to live no matter what. Um, So and made it so I don't have to make that decision um, and have that stress because I've already determined that decision um, before I'm put in those awkward situations. This might be a weird question, but how would you feel if you got into a situation and you went against your standards? Like, how do you think you'd feel after? Not good. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have anything else with that. I mean, I had a really cool opportunity where I, um, one of the richest people in New Zealand is a guy named Kim.com. He changed his name legally to Kim.com. Like DOT? Like dot, like a period, like a, like a website. Yeah. Um, That's so funny. He's like, Hey Devin, I'm a huge fan of your work. I want to fly you out, um, to New Zealand first class. I never flown first class before. And, um, I want to just give you the ultimate experience. So, and he said, you can fly any friend. So I flew the girl I was dating at the time. We, we got there and it was like really important to me that we didn't stay in the same room. So, and then we had this like massive mansion. So put us in two different rooms and we spent the full like two weeks with them. He had a private helicopter so we could just take the helicopter wherever we wanted in New Zealand. And um, like while we were there, um, Black Eyed Peas were there because they were recording an album with them. Um, Natasha Bedingfield was there. They, they were there as well, staying in, like in their, like Insane. he's just a fan of art or creators. Yeah. So he's just... And spent two weeks with them. And we were at the pool with like Natasha Benny and Phil, this super rich guy, the biggest mansion in New Zealand. And he stops and he's like, he looks at us and he's a big family guy. He's like five or six kids. And he's like, I've noticed something about you guys. And I'm like, oh no, what's going to happen? Like, is he going to like not happy with us? And he's like, you guys don't swear. You guys don't drink. You guys, don't, and you guys are staying in two separate rooms. He's like, you guys are living a different rule book that I've ever seen. And he's like, and that's what I want for my kids. So it was just like this really cool where we weren't like pushing our religion or anything. Mm -hmm. But then we had this full conversation about like God and our view of of God. And it was done in this like really amazing, awesome way. And it was just from living what we knew, like what we had decided how we were going to live. And it rubbed off. It was like this conversation with Black Eyed Peas and Natasha Bedingfield and us all in the swimming pool. And I was like... Wait, the Black Eyed Peas are part of the conversation too? Part of the conversation as well. No it was way. Fr- Prince from the Black Eyed Peas. I don't know if you know who he is, but it was like the whole Black Eyed Peas, but it was one of the main main guys for it. So it was like this stressful thing, but it was like this really cool opportunity to like talk about it openly. And, and it was like, he respected it because mm-hmm. he saw that it was important to us and that we were, we were staying true to it. So dude, incredible. But I've had a lot of those type of like larger than life experiences. Yeah. You've been really influential for a lot of people, whether you want that. Yeah, or yeah. Not. That is, that's kind of on your shoulders. And so you're doing a really, really good job. But I mean, like I went to Nepal and um, it was the same conversation is they were like you guys are like always happy and they said there's been one film crew that's come through here and it was for a show called meet the mormons <laughs> and i was like they were so happy too and just like good people and i was like yes like they like they were planting seeds yeah and, and it was like people before us were, were already doing it so it was just like cool scene and then by us doing it too it was like they realized we're not weird people we're just like trying to figure it out too but like it is important to us to to live those standards but for me it's like and i'm never like preachy or very rant not not very little like i never want to be people's face but i'm like i'm a i I live the standards of the church i'm not going to preach in your face which maybe sometimes i need to do it a little bit more but i want people to know that we're normal people like we we're we struggle we're trying to figure it out but we're also like we're cool too you know Mm -hmm. so it's, it's been like a really cool opportunity i feel to to kind of to see that. And I feel so much right now is there's so many people kind of falling this way or that way with so many different voices. And I was like, no, there's still believers out there. There They're still that. And they know, and they're fully convicted. And because you've had this one 
experience or this or that, like that doesn't mean it's not true. Um, so it's just been really cool. Like we do have a voice and like the people that believe too also need to be speaking about it. Dude, I totally agree. That's why this podcast exists. I, just, I felt <laughs> like I, I had to, I didn't really yeah, want yeah. to, but I'm, I'm going to do it. So, um, I just a couple more questions. Yeah, yeah. I want to know what is your most, pr- what, what video are you most proud of? Like what, what one, if you had to say, this is my favorite so far, which one is it? And yeah. So, I mean, I have another kid on the way, so I can't fully say, but I imagine like, so for me, videos are like my kids where each one of them is like so different and mm-hmm. unique. You kind of love totally. them all. I get it. Um, and each one of them is like a drastically different experience. Every one of them is hard to create. Mm-hmm. And every one of them, like a lot of them are, I like put my heart and, and all my money into it and then it bombs. And then I hate the video, even though I loved it right before I released it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think like if I were to like say like I have a couple, they're usually the my more personal ones. Um, I've done a lot with my dad mm-hmm. where we'll go out and travel. Like we did the Great Bear Rainforest, like all these amazing places. Um, I took my wife to the Bahamas and we did like a submarine thing for another video. Like the ones th- that are the most meaningful are the ones where I have like meaningful experiences, especially with like family, mm-hmm. um, whether it's my dad, whether it's like the first YouTube video I did or one of the first videos I did, it was just like this camping trip in Canada with my siblings and my parents. And like that one's a super important one. It wasn't because I'm way more professional than I was 11, 12, 13 years ago, but it was just like no pressure doing what I love with the people that I love. So um, I think that all plays into it big time. Dude, how cool is that? It's your, it's your family videos, which tells me where your core values are. So that's awesome. Any, okay. So two more questions. Any, any last things you want to say before we wrap? And I have one, one last question. Um, the, the pot, the member, the goal of the podcast is to help our fellow brothers feel less alone in their struggles and then to show showcase guys living lives with the divine. Um, yeah, I, I think for me, it's like you have success this week or you get your paycheck this week and, and then next week you don't. Mm-hmm. So for me, it's, it's really just, um, I think one of the things that's kind of helped me through all that is I heard this like in, in I want to say high school, but the difference between a rich man and a poor man, and this goes for physical wealth. This goes for spiritual wealth. Any type of thing you're going for in your life is a rich man plans four years in advance and a poor man plans for the weekend. Um, so I've just seen that so true is like the things that matter most and are going to make the biggest difference are the things you're not doing on the weekends. Mm -hmm. Like I'm going to party with my friends on the weekend. Like when I was going to BYU on the weekends, I was like filming on film shoots. I was studying filmmaking. It was like, um, the things that matter spiritually too are the things, it's all the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's knowing like, today is going to suck or tomorrow is going to suck. And I'm going to be crying. Like we just moved. We've gone through all these hard things. Um, this new baby we have dropping soon, baby girl in two weeks, like we had two miscarriages to get to that point. Mm -hmm. And we were like, and the last one we lost was like a three month old baby. Then we had a miscarriage. So it was like, we held our little baby boy and he didn't make it. And like, Mm -hmm. I'm okay with it now, but it was just like all these hard things lead up to this moment. And then it's like, now it makes perfect sense uh, of it has so much more meaning because of it. And it's like high school was awful. I, I didn't have any friends, had a very few friends, but now looking back at it, I understand and I'm so much better because of it. So just knowing the bigger picture, planning four years in advance has really like changed my, my mindset um, that trials and tribulations are mandatory, um, but misery is an option. And I really think like that's a, a, a true principle mm-hmm. as far as um, it's just like, finding and it's not easy and and like the reality is people are like oh he knows what he's doing he's had success um but it's like i'm making it up as i go every week every day um but for me it's just like staying close to christ um and that's always been huge for us um and luckily like i have this incredible wife that also is like so in tune with that that um like you know think about it, like now it makes me emotional but like that's been so important to her and it's so important to me and it's like now we want our our son to have that um my wife was actually really sick. I almost like, called you and like, I, I think I'm gonna have to cancel on him. Um, she was throwing up all night. Mm. And um, then um, my wife was like in tears this morning. And um, I was like, Atlas, that's our, our son. I was like, can you say a prayer that mommy will be okay? And um, this is a three-year-old. And he said like the most perfect prayer. Um, and it just like, it was just like this. And then my wife was like, Atlas, that was like the most perfect prayer. And then my wife went to sleep for like the last three hours and she like woke up perfect. So it was cool to see like my son's like he could see and it does not necessarily that any prayer instantly works, just add water to her, you know. But um, my son got to see that firsthand. It's been really cool. Like, 
yesterday when my son fell down from his bike, um, he was in tears. Okay, Alice, is it okay that I say a prayer? Um, and then we said a prayer, and, and we've instilled that in him, that whenever something's hard, we say a prayer as a family. So then this opportunity came today, this morning, that he could pray for my wife, and he got to see that that miracle take place. And we also got to see, like, for me, it's like, I want to have a better family. I want to be known as a, a better dad than a better filmmaker. Um, so for me, like just balancing that it, it's like balance is really hard. Um, especially in the, the world of social media where it takes everything from you, but like the family is most important to me. Um, and like, I want to be known as this incredible dad instead of like this, um, person on social media. So like, even as I had a family, I feel like my social media, um, falling has dropped but that's okay because my family has risen mm -hmm. um and in 20 years 30 years from now like i won't have regrets with my family um and i won't have regrets with my film because i had this incredible family through that so. i hope you enjoyed this episode more importantly i hope you feel closer to your creator if you find yourself wanting to strengthen your relationship with god i'm a huge fan of the skylight app it's full of beautiful high quality daily spiritual practices finally never forget in all things God works for the good of those who love him.